Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for something very special today. I'm Zuma JD, bringing you another exclusive interview. Today's guest is a crypto legend, the master of squeakly lines, a very good friend of mine. You're listening to Zuma JD, interview number four. We're talking crypto, economics, and sci-fi with Cryptopathic. How are you going? Hey, uh, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm good. Cool, man. Just before we got recording, we were talking a little bit about the virus, and you were just about to tell me your theory on why they are doing what they're doing, essentially. What are your thoughts in general on the coronavirus? I, I think it'll be just as bad as it was in April in, like, two weeks. Mm. We can go back to, to what it was. Right. Do you think there'll be a second wave of lockdowns and economic interventions and market dumps? Yeah, I'm expecting it. I don't think the crash will be as big in markets this time because like, it, it's pretty obvious that the, the Fed are willing to print as much money <laughs> as they want. Right? Um, and like the, the fellow scheme in the UK is pretty good, but it doesn't look like it's as good in America, really. So I don't know. I don't know mm. how to cope. But that, that might be why they're having it so much worse than other countries like, cause, like Texas or... Um, for it on the way ahead on the right. curve because like people have to go back to work yeah one reason i'm really excited for this interview is i want to spend a fair chunk of time talking about your ideas on economics there's a lot of people who are in crypto who maybe really understand crypto trading uh and whatever but i think you have some really nice novel uh but quite well thought out ideas about economics in general so i really look forward okay, to thank you uh, yeah, getting I've never studied it or anything, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's interesting, like you've come to your own conclusion. We'll get a bit to that later, but before we get into general economics, maybe if you could say a little bit about how you got into cryptocurrency and trading. Okay, so I was playing World of Warcraft 10 years ago, and I, I used to play with this guy, and he, he found out about Bitcoin in like 2010, and he was mining it with his laptop, but I, I was like 13 years old at the time, so I had no idea what he was on about. But then, a few years later, when it started taking off, so this would be early 2013, or maybe like 2012 he mentioned it. I started looking into it more, but I didn't, I didn't buy any until April 2013, which is where it had like uh, the first big run-up yeah. really that most people heard about when, when Cyprus, uh, when their banks stole like everything. And <laughs> all that happened. That was when I got into it for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't have to trade or anything. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't understand like how exchanges worked or anything, I just bought through some of the like dodgy OTC 15% fee or something disgusting yeah so given that Cyprus thing like did, were you actually interested in interested in what happened in Cyprus or oh no not at all I just want to make money like... <laughs> <laughs> right right how long from there did it take you to get really into crypto or did it just kind of slowly happen over time so I, I can't remember exactly because it's such a long time ago now but like I, I definitely mm. um I downloaded the Bitcoin wallet in like late 2012 I didn't well. do anything with it. And I didn't have any of my money, really. Or, like, my parents wouldn't let me buy any. So I was 15 yeah. when I was doing this. But I didn't buy any until the April, and then after that, I just kind of held on to it for ages. Um, I didn't do any how to trade or anything until later on in the year, uh, maybe, like, October or so. I mm -hmm. kind of figured it out, took an interest in it again. And then that was just before, like, Silk Road went down, and then all coins blew up for the first time on a Cripsy and yeah. BTC and all of that. Um, and then like seeing all those price movements, I was like, wow, I can actually make money with this. So I started paying more attention to it. I remember from the um, the Loomdart interview, he said that there was some point where he decided that he was an entrepreneur because he made, <laughs> made so much money from trading uh, oh. that it could be a legitimate uh, lifestyle. Okay, so it sounds like, yeah, it just, just kind of happened. Cryptocurrency accidentally hijacked your life and all these other people's yeah. lives. Yeah, well, I, I was already interested in, in trading somewhat, but like, obviously I had no way of doing because I was only 15 years old. I can't sign up for a broker or anything. Yeah. Right, so Bitcoin was like the only route I could do it with real money. And like I had um, I'd run bots on World of Warcraft for like sniping auctions and like uh. undercutting people and stuff. So I had like a basic understanding of how markets work. Yeah. I didn't really, I, but, like, I didn't really know real financial markets. So it, it was, I really enjoyed it. Mm. It was like, hey, I can use my money to make money. And didn't mean I, I mean, I didn't have to get a job or anything. Yeah, <laughs> so. I, I don't know how early this would have been, like maybe 2014, 2015. 
uh, I remember there was like these big rushes after Mount after Mount Gox, like the price really crashed uh, when Mount Gox got hacked, and then eventually Bitcoin went sideways for a fair amount of time. It was like the first big sideways move, and all of the people who'd been trading it a lot decided to get into like forex and stuff on Twitter. Uh, and there yeah. was this big thing where everyone was like, you know, if you're a real trader, you should be trading everything, not just crypto. And everyone was trying to trade all this other crap. And um, I was like, stuff this. Mostly because I was under 18, I couldn't get the account. So I was like, yeah, you know, I couldn't even do this if I wanted to. But I remember Could thinking that was crypto. really bizarre. Yeah, um, if you have an age in the market, just stick to it. There's not really... Mm. Yeah. But you, I think you would... Uh, I think, seem to recall you dabbling in forex stuff like way back in the um, day. I never really got anywhere with it. Right. I did try, but yeah, it didn't yeah, go. Yeah, so definitely like it, just going on with the fad. <laughs> 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 okay, and then how would you say your trading style and how you approach things has changed over the years compared to when you first got started and, and today? Like, Do you still trade as much as you did back then? Was there uh... like a peak or...? Uh, well, I think I, I definitely just got all in with my money back then, but like that was because it wasn't like a crazy amount of money. It was like, okay, well, I'm going to get rich doing this, so I'm just going to go to uni or whatever, right? So mm. <laughs> it didn't it didn't matter too much if I lost some money, so I could afford to use like all of it. Obviously, right. I don't do that now because it's like a more serious amount of money. Um, <laughs> so I'm more diversified now. I definitely take longer term positions, but things don't move as quickly as they used to, so I suppose that's why yeah right what do you think about the crypto market in general is in for example you just said that prices move slower now the markets are slower in general why do you think that is well it, it's all become sort of more efficient in a way like people know all coins can do crazy things right so you have more people trying to buy the bottom and then when it does pump there's so many people in profit they they know they want to cash out mm. sooner and like it, it's all people know all of these things that happen so they're, they're ready for these opportunities and so you have diminishing returns on all of these strategies that like in the past you could hold something 100x or 1000x and then cash it out but you can't do that anymore because so many other people are in that same trade mm. so it's uh it's hard to get those same returns yeah okay there's this kind of paradox with cryptocurrency where a lot of people are super attracted to it from a trading perspective because it's so free market in the sense that you know it's yeah. not very regulated anyone can whip up an exchange it trades 24 7 it's global etc but also yeah. at the same time it's potentially an extremely manipulated um <laughs> market as well i think it's nice to know because like, like it lets people like me when i was 15 to get into trading um mm. that might not necessarily be a good thing <laughs> right, but at least it gave me the freedom to do that yeah um yeah no it it gets a bad name because of all the scams that go on because it's so easy to get away with all that stuff and like if you steal money as well there's no way to reverse it and it's very easy to to wash it do you think there's like a small group of people that control the price or something like that well it's controlled by larger buyers yeah like, i think most things are like that though and it's not necessarily them doing it on purpose um, if you buy a huge chunk of the supply, you're going to have to find someone to unload that onto eventually, right? You're probably yeah. not going to be able to do that to loads and loads of like retail investors. Right. Because it's just, it's very difficult to find that many people. When rich people buy this stuff, they're, they're willing to hold on it for forever, pretty much. They're not, they're not too interested in trying to flip it. Yeah. I was having a conversation with a lawyer and, you know, he brought up the whole BART pattern thing. And I don't know <laughs> if that's, it's obviously a meme. Is, yeah, well, yeah, it's been happening since... Uh, at least 2015. Right, yeah, so common. he said that that was evidence of market manipulation, which is... The There's case. a lot of things it could be, right? Like if, if someone knows they've got an OTC deal and they want to fix the price for that mm. like when it goes through, or mm. there, there's so many things it could be, really. But the point isn't whether, like, isn't why someone's doing it. It's it's whether it can occur at all and whether it's an indication of market manipulation <coughs> and the ability of people uh, just yeah, to fix I'd, prices. Yeah, I'd say it is. Really? Yeah. Can you explain exactly why the BART pattern is so suspicious? <laughs> because to be um, honest, it isn't obvious to me. Like, why is it something that doesn't occur in other markets or? I mean, it does, I think it does occur sometimes in other markets, right? I mean, it's not, <laughs> well, you don't, just by looking at the chart, you can't, you can never know why something's happened, right? Obviously someone's bought a large amount and then someone, but like nothing happens and then someone sells a large amount, so. Yeah. I don't know, <laughs> it but, could be anything really. Like, right, right. But that, like, uh, the way you're asking, uh, I'm trying to think. It, it could be someone like they accumulate a large position, and then if they know there are like no other large buyers or sellers in the market, then they can fix the price higher or lower depending on their 
to, to their own advantage, right? And mm-hmm. then they can exit that position because if you run like a market making bot or something, you know what the inflows and outflows are, like how much buying and selling is done every day, just like passively by people. So it lets you get free money basically because you have you have more information than the rest of the market, and no one if you if you know no one's going to interfere with it, then you may as well do it. Yeah, yeah. I don't really know enough about. I guess it's TA in a way to understand what all these different patterns mean and and what's normal. Well, and what's I, I not. think you need knowledge of like um, the the larger buyers and sellers as well. Like now they behave. The see market. Mm. Like if if you know no one's willing to sell at a certain price, then like you can move the market price to that, and then get all of the the retail and like algorithms to buy right. your bag and then dump it back down. And yeah, it, it's. It, I mean, it, like there are so many things it could be that I don't think it's worth speculating really, but. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, someone figures out that they can make money by moving the price like that, and then they try it. Like they might not even make money. You don't even you don't even know if they make money, right? Well, exactly. So I think this is that's a really important point. So maybe it's not a surprise that there is so much. Maybe not manipulation, but attempted manipulation. You could say because it is a free market. Uh, It's an open. It's a relatively open market. So people are free to try different things, but it's not a given that these things will work for example say if you wanted to do this OTC deal and you tried to manipulate the price upwards for a short time window while you're you know selling a chunk of your coins or something and then for some other reason the price crashes I don't know 50% in a day (laughs) then that would be a shame then yeah then then you you could still get screwed so you know maybe we were going to get a BART pattern and then the price just drops suddenly maybe it's a competition between manipulators and retailers just getting thrown around in the middle or something like that and there's some kind of <clears throat> truer value proposition underwriting the whole thing and like rising all boats over time yeah well if you just you know hold longer time it doesn't it doesn't matter if you there's a bot or right it doesn't i don't really pay attention to them so uh, i don't think it's worth speculating about why they happen because there are just so many people involved in the market and so mm. you Okay, this reminds me of another thing, just to get get your thoughts on this kind of stuff in general. I guess what I'm trying to get to as well is like whether this actually matters. Say when I was talking to this lawyer, he's like, this is so bad, all these BART patterns are so bad. And I'm like, first of all, this doesn't, indi- this doesn't necessarily indicate anything malicious uh, because even if it is manipulation, does it even matter? Something like that, essentially. If you're able to push the market up for 10 minutes, then like, is that actually bad or does it matter? Um, I mean, if, if people do have that much of a hold in the market, then they, they have like huge exposure to Bitcoin right. as well. Right. Right. So they're, they're taking a huge risk on top of that. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> I've heard another person in the crypto space make a case uh, for insider trading, which, is, which was hilarious, but really fascinating at the same time. They were saying that if you allow insider trading, markets will become more stable. It would be a more true price, yeah, but it would also be unfair on people who don't have the information. But, like, if you say Wirecard, for instance, if you had insider information that all the money was missing, mm. then you know the stock's worthless and then you can just, like, destroy everyone else in the market. But, like, say you have less impactful information, but it still means the price is going to change. Mm. Um, but, like, you know it's a sure thing you making trades in that direction that can tell other people in the market that something's wrong, right? Just because of how the price action behaves. Right, but... And so the, yeah. the information sort of spreads. Yeah, exactly. That That's that way. exactly the idea. But, oh, yeah, I, I don't think it's... Like, when it comes to companies, I don't think it's a good thing mm. to have, like, inside a trade. But then, like, stock buybacks are things, so what do I know? I think it depends what you value more. The same person who said... who made this case for um, insider trading also said that his main reason about why he disagreed with insider trading being illegal was because you're the government is forcing people to be market irrational <laughs> so his his priority is clearly there with everyone being a rational market okay. actor so as in if you know something about a company and that would mean the stock will go down then you should sell it uh, if you can because that would be the rational thing to do and then other people you know even with that wire card example if yeah people started finding out the money's missing and started dumping the stock then people would start to be like oh my god what's going on at Wirecard and there's more scrutiny people find a way to do it anyway right like with backhand deals and stuff so I don't, I don't know if it really right. even prevents anything yeah 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 
you have made a lot of really, really, really good calls. Not Thank all you. good calls. Uh, for example, <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there that you told me to buy a peer coin at the peak. Um, oh, that was all time. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I was. I remember. I, I was, remember. I was just so upset, man. I, what year would have that been? <laughs> Oh, was it 2016? Uh, it was maybe? around, there was like or the Litecoin halving around the same time. Maybe it, was, maybe it was 2015. Yeah, no, it would have been 2015. Then. Yeah, and I remember you messaged me because there was this fake story going around that Elon Musk Tesla. was going yeah. to partner with Peercoin. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> And it was really strange because usually when I'd asked you about coins and stuff, you'd always kind of give me like a few breadcrumbs, but you like trade your own account, man, which is the best advice you can give someone. But I think I didn't even ask you what you were trading. I think you messaged me out of the blue and like, buy peer coin. It's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a it's a sure thing or something like that, which oh, I should have yeah, read as sarcasm or something that I was just like, oh, well, yeah, I'll put all my Litecoin halving profits into peer coin. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, but yeah, that um, was a disaster. I remember that. Oh. Yeah, but but generally speaking, you've consistently made extremely good calls, including the the famous uh, cursed chart. I think a lot that of people really love that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's your process for predicting the future? I just guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, I, I don't, uh, there's not really anything to, I put this in the description of the curse chart. I don't think there's any, there's not many things you can compare Bitcoin to, um, mm. market wise. Mm. Like, so yeah, I just used, uh, overlays for, that was the April 2013 bubble mm -hmm. or the early 2013 bubble I use on that. Uh, it's just a parabolic chart. There's, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of charts that look like that. So I just put it over. Okay. Like, yeah. Okay. Um, but I did. I did have so that I, I did have uh, an idea for the date it would top, and I was correct. I think it was the eighteenth of December because that was what was it? Something happened on that day. Mm. Was it the futures? I think futures went live on one of the American stock exchanges. Right. Yeah, that was it. That was so. I was like, okay, it's going to top on that date, and I I was like twenty twenty five thousand dollars, <laughs> and it hit the lower bound of that. So, you know. so and then good. it crashed to when well, I went to six thousand at first. Well, yeah, I said I wanted twenty five hundred. For mm. the bottom, but it got to thirty-two in the end, so mm. almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, close enough. Did you buy the bottom? Uh, not as much as I should have, really. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Just quickly, like, I think I've told you when when the price dumped at the start of this year in March. I didn't buy it because I thought it it was like the first dump. Like usually the the whole V shape recovery thing is 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 literally like one of the most stupid memes I've ever heard. At least, at, or so I thought first. I mean, this is so silly. This never happens. This is just like, everyone's cut and sad. But um, later on, I realized that something like there was no one left to sell or something, except maybe me. Well, if, if Bitcoin, or like any big cryptocurrency is down 50% of the day, you just buy it, there's no... Yeah, in hindsight, <laughs> it's pretty obvious. It. I just, um. I don't know why I was so numb, man. I remember watching it. I was just like, I don't care. It's going to go down again. There'll be another 50% drop in three days, I bet you. And then it'll be like total 70% down or something, and I'll buy that. But you're right. Like, it should have should just averaged in over the dumps or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah, just, since when does it do that? You have to, like, double bottom or test, well, I think test it. What happened was there was just a huge margin call because um, from, like, mm. I can't remember, well, like, the start of the year, we were at 7,000, right, and then it just got bid up. But um, almost all of that was just margin longs. Mm. So they all had to close at once, basically. And then 6K was big support. But I think whoever would have been buying at that level was like, oh, we, well, we can just wipe everyone out if we just don't bid. Mm. So they didn't, and they got everyone at 4K instead. So Yeah, so. makes sense. Okay, but before we, before we move on, just a little bit more about your guessing, your professional guessing. Mm -hmm. And this is a cliche question, but... Are you like a TA person or do you like watch the news or do you, is it long-term trends like, or is it a bit of everything? A bit of everything, really, mm. yeah. I don't really pay attention to the news as much anymore because I don't think it's as important. Yeah, um, I've definitely noticed that too. Yeah, I'm, I'm long-term bullish now, really. I don't really have any other ideas about the price. Mm. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm just long-term bullish, man. I just buy sometimes and it just works out. 
<laughs> you just, well, your yeah. average entry is just so low. <laughs> If you have um, if you have patience, right? You see a drop like that. Why would you not buy if you're a spot? Do you have like spot money? Like why would you, yeah? Here's a very controversial idea. There's so much dumb money in crypto, man. There's a lot of very average I minds. Think there's less now, but yeah. Yeah, but there's a lot of very average or inexperienced and immature trading minds, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm one of them. It's just as a function of age. When I look back about how I've thought about trading in money i just go oh my god i'm so lucky that i bought into this like rocket asset that you can't mess up in (laughs) but we've been we've been just trading the bull rally of a century or something i think in hindsight because all of the opportunity cost and stupid trades i've made even march this year is a perfect example i happened to be at the time not doing work and just had all day and i literally sat there just watching the chart and didn't do anything and i had it was pretty fun yeah i get that but and it wasn't even like now i'm freaking out i had a lot of bitcoin but i didn't sell it and i had a lot of cash as well and i, I just didn't do anything i just watched it and was like oh it'll come back down again and i'll buy it later and then just watched the v-shape thing happen and, and never <laughs> never changed my mind only yeah. literally like in the past couple of weeks have i gone like oh maybe it's not going to come down which makes me think that it will come down now <laughs> But yeah, there's like a lot of pretty average minds, but it's okay. It's like we're all amateurs just trying to figure this thing out. But th- this is why like the most basic ways of working win, like just holding coins long term, just yeah, buying don't dips. Don't get owned leverage trading, you just, you're good. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so would you ever sell all your crypto? Uh, no, because I've reached a point where I'm happy to just lose money on it. Mm. Like long term, I don't mind. Like I, there's there's definitely points where I divest some, but I wouldn't. I'd never sell all of it. There's not much point. Right. So there's I guess there's a couple of ways of looking at this. First one is the financial aspect, as in like, would you sell yeah. your crypto for financial reasons? But you kind of just said that's wouldn't happen. Well, yeah. But there's also like for me, I've got this personal thing where sometimes every essentially I've had a few times in my life where I've tried to move away from crypto and do other things because it's been. Yeah such a big part of my life at least since I was conscious as in I think I first came aware of crypto when I was like 14 and then you know just it's just kind of sucked a lot of my energy and time up um which has been great like I've obviously it's changed my life for the better but sometimes I go like I wonder if if I want to do something else with my life if I have to like actually untangle myself almost completely maybe that's a silly way of looking at it but at sometimes I guess if it, it helps you focus, it makes sense, yeah. Mm. Yeah, because then you have to think about the price, you have to check it every 20 seconds. Um, yeah. It can be stressful. Yeah. But I think if you if you have an amount of money in it that you're, you're fine losing, then that shouldn't really be a problem. Mm. So you just, like, downsize until you get to that, really. What if you what if you had to sell your crypto? Where would you put it? Oh, probably more on gold. Yeah. I've, I've been buying more gold recently um, oh. and uh, probably some stocks as well because you know, it's print money forever. <laughs> mm. Can't lose. Literally can't lose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, man. I, I got into gold as a road to crypto. Like, I, I bought gold before I bought crypto. Yeah. There's a little gold shop a uh, block away from where I am right now and that's where I used to go in and, and buy, like, little packets of gold. <laughs> and I, like, when I was 15, I'd go in and, like, try to talk to the person behind the counter about like gold bug theories and stuff and usually be some like early 20s chick just she'd be like what what are you talking about i just i'm at uni man this is just my part-time job (laughs) have you heard of uh like mike there's like this gold bug mike someone mike maloney or something i don't know he had this youtube channel and he'd always be like you know the next currency war is upon us any moment and then so i'd go into the gold shop on the weekend, I'd travel in from my small town on the bus for like two hours, buy some gold. And, yeah. Be like, did you see Mike Slater's YouTube video? Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, it was very yeah, teenage brain. Never been to a city before. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, gold, gold's fun. It's just Bitcoin for boomers, isn't it? It's, yeah. Man, it doesn't move enough to be exciting. I mean, there's something attractive about Bitcoin and as like this hedge against, you know, the world... Yeah, imploding or something, and then 
gold is the same thing except gold's like physical so the computers will blow up or something <laughs> you still yeah. have your gold <laughs> <laughs> i think we'd have worse problems but yeah <laughs> mm. do you think it's too late to get into crypto <clears throat> depends what part of it like i, I think Hmm. I, I think like investing in Bitcoin passively or like Ethereum, so I mean, that's fine. Um, all coins, most all coins, you're probably going to get destroyed on. But then there's always new things that come out like DeFi or mm. um, new tokens on Ethereum, like digital collectibles or whatever. It's, there's always new stuff that comes along. It's just it's not as obvious now. So I think for people getting into it, it's probably going to be hard for them to find it because there's just such a big barrier of things to learn. Yeah, and it's, it's more complicated. Yeah. And it's not as easy to make money as well as so people aren't really as motivated to learn about it. So there's probably less people getting into it, but mm. it doesn't necessarily mean it's too late. No. What do you think the teenagers of tomorrow are going to be getting their taste oh. of the market life? Um, a lot of them do like collectible fashion items like shoes or yeah, all sorts. Just I know fashion is a big thing, like reselling that. That, that seems to be something I hear a lot about. But, Interesting, yeah. Like on yeah, like mean. Facebook trade groups and whatever. Yeah. Uh, StockX, I think it's called. Oh. They trade sneakers on there. Yeah, I think generally reselling is probably the first thing most people will get exposed to in like terms of entrepreneurship and trading and flipping stuff. Video games, like most kids, most kids don't play World of Warcraft or anything with like a free market. Or I guess CS:GO has one, but like Fortnite doesn't. Mm. Um, Cause like you don't have you don't have kids in playgrounds with like Pokemon cards and stuff anymore, so I don't think they learn trading through that or anything. And most mm. most games they play, they'll they'll like internalize the economy, so the company makes all the money. Like there's no way, there's no secondary market proof to profit off usually. I I have a good which is where I have a good trading cards story, man. I, um, okay. When I just started school, everyone was into Yu-Gi-Oh, and um, I used to do like Yu-Gi-Oh trading, and I'd take Love my it. pocket money, yeah, take my pocket money from like my grandparents and go you know, buy Yu-Gi-Oh cards and just do people favors for Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And I, I became like the Yu-Gi-Oh card baron uh, <laughs> <laughs> for like, for prep, which is the youngest year level at school. Okay. And then I remember one day, you know, I was showing off all my cards and we used to put them in these like big snap lock bags and I'd sort them out and everything. I was just hanging yeah, yeah. out in like the school quadrangle and this big this big thug of a kid, like like cartoonish. When I but maybe I've <laughs> forgotten what he actually looked like, but when I when I think like when I think back to the memory, I just picture myself as a scrawny little kid with his like snap block bags of hundreds of Yu-Gi-Oh cards walking around. And this kid just came up. He just he picked them up off the floor and just walked off. He just stole wow. them. Like just outright like came up, just grabbed them and walked off. And I was like, oh. And everyone was just looking like, what do we do? Because we're all like half this kid's size. I Did think you some tell anyone? I think I got some of them back, but he convinced me that I had to trade him or something like <laughs> it's, it's something really messed up like that. It was like I think I went back was like, Oh, those are my cards and he was like, Oh, you want the cards back, we have to do a trade and then Do you think he works for like the tax revenue service now? <laughs> <laughs> or he's like a he's a it's car park inspector or something shit like that. <laughs> He's a train ticket inspector. <laughs> oh man, it was. I I had my Yu-Gi-Oh card stolen as well. I know I don't know who did it, but oh. yeah, I lost a lot as well. I I never used to trade them though. I used to, I just collected them really. Damn. So they just they disappeared at school or yeah. something? Or? Yeah, yeah, at school some guy. I don't know. Don't know how they did it. They were pretty crafty. Damn. Is that the first taste of market manipulation? People <laughs> <laughs> people messing with the supply. I think oh, that might be a different word for you, I don't know. But, um, yeah, talk about trading cards. They've been going mm. pretty crazy lately, the market for, um, like, Pokemon. Especially Pokemon, mainly Pokemon. And I, I know baseball, I don't know anything about baseball cards, but I know they've been doing really well lately. Um, I'm, from, I'm from the UK, so mm. baseball isn't really a thing here. Right. Um, but I know in America, they're, they're absolutely huge. And the market's been doing really well from what I hear. Same with, like, uh, basketball Mm. Whatever else. I've also heard yeah, about collectibles. like Magic the Gathering. Is that? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that that's bigger than Pokemon cards. They had a bubble in 2017, 2018, I think. I, I I'm not an expert on this market either, really. But there's there's a guy called Rudy, uh, Rudy Alpha Investments. He mm. he has a YouTube channel. He's pretty funny. He does like reselling of Magic the Gathering cards and like investing in stuff and all that stuff. It, it's a huge market. Like collectibles as a market is getting bigger and bigger. Because, like, as the younger generations, they, they grow up and they get more disposable income, they want to spend money on this stuff, like, not just for nostalgia value, but 
they like collecting, they like new stuff. They yeah, yeah. It's kind of like art. Um, like like you, like some pieces of artwork, they go, they get like ridiculous prices, right? There was one four hundred fifty million. Obviously, that's ancient. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but it's still it's the same category. Yeah. Right. I think the biggest difference though between these types of things and cryptocurrency, like you can still collect cryptocurrency in that sense and. Uh, as you've often yeah. pointed out, you know, there's a lot of so, overlap between having, if you like to collect things, you can be into crypto. But uh, I think the biggest difference is cryptocurrency is a fungible, whereas these collector items aren't so Yeah, much. yeah, yeah. It makes the liquidity a lot harder to... Exactly. Kind of like, it's harder to understand the market because, yeah, yeah there's there's so many differences in things, yeah. All right, and then say with the with the fine art thing. I've got a theory that there's some artwork yeah. that two rich people want. They're just going to bid it up, bidding out of spite because they just want to screw over someone or something. Like They're just like, I don't want that guy to have this artwork, so I'm just going to like <laughs> bid it up to piss him off because I don't like him or something. Yeah. Like rich people, they really, like they'll pay anything for something if they want it, which is what drives a lot of the market <laughs> in collectibles. Um, it's like, well, this is why you have like absolutely ridiculous prices. Um, yeah. Or like what seemed like ridiculous to normal people because they'll never be able to afford it, mm. right? But like to because the the wealth inequality is growing so much, like people can afford to spend half a billion on a painting. Right. It's right. crazy, like, man. It's un unimaginable when like. Yeah, I think this is a good segue into economics in general. Okay. So, yeah, inequality. I used to get Bloomberg Business Week delivered, like the magazine. And the, the magazine's quite cool. Like, it'll just tell you, like, all these little interesting business stories going on. And it's really optimistic because, obviously, Bloomberg's, like, trying to push this agenda that, like, everything's fine with capitalism and, like, <laughs> look how exciting it is. Like, just read this magazine. There's all these great businesses. And, you know, if you want to get ahead, you can get ahead. When I was, like, 16, 17, I concluded that pretty much the only way to make money at this stage eventually is if we keep this, like, consumer market, I think there's going to become a point where like everyday people, their wealth just keeps going sideways or down and rich people keep getting richer. Essentially, the only way to like make a great business will be to start a business that target, targets like really wealthy people. Yes, yes. So yeah. for example, the best example I got in Bloomberg, I love this one so much, was there was a man who ran a pool installation company, you okay. know, backyard pools. And during the GFC, he got really screwed because everyday people weren't installing pools because they had no money. But then he got a call from some billionaire who's like, hey, man, can you do like a special installation? And he's like, maybe, mm -hmm. what do you want? And he goes, oh, I, I want a pool in the shape of a violin. <laughs> so this guy's like, uh, you know, it's not my area of expertise, like making custom pools, but, you know, so I could... Uh, I'll have to charge you 100 times my, my usual rate. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. He, he charged this guy what he would usually earn in a year to do this one pool. <laughs> And the guy's yeah. like, yeah, 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 that's fine, whatever. Just, just giving you my violin yeah. shape pool. Yeah. And suddenly he's like, oh, okay. So he did this, and then the billionaire's friend was impressed. So he told his friends, like, get these custom pools done. Now this guy's got this like, uh, custom pools business going on, and he's making buckets. <laughs> um, yeah, lu luxury goods and like art and stuff in general, because mm. because you have buyers like that who are willing to spend any amount of money. It's there's, um, if you know what you're doing, then yeah, you can find opportunities like that and make really stupid amounts of money. And because most people, like wages are staying pretty stagnant, but then stocks keep going up. Like they get bowed out, mm. they keep making money. Their, their wealth keeps going up. So it's easier, you, you make more money if you target rich people rather than like trying to sell something to everyone. Mm. Right, because the barrier to entry is just, it's too high. You can't afford the capital or anything. Mm. But okay. if you, yeah. If you want to get rich, you, you need to look at selling to rich people. Right. Now. Yeah, yeah, more so than historically. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, they, they keep the ownership of all of the capital and they, they hire they hire people to run it all for them, but they don't actually give them mm. as much as they'd be making normally. So, like, no one no one can really climb to their level. Mm. So it's not it's not possible to move class by just working for them. So you have to sell them something that they want, like a violin pool, and, <laughs> and you get rich. <laughs> Then it scales. Then you get the exponential returns and so on. We don't need a revolution, man. Just make violin pools, dude. Then we can have a peaceful transfer of wealth. <laughs> Just do like <laughs> hundreds of pools. Uh, yeah. Well, the um, when when Bitcoin blew up the first, when it went to like thirty-two dollars back in twenty eleven, most of that buying was the Wigfoss twins. Right. Was the money they got from Facebook. So like, that that was kind of 
the same thing, right? Because they they've seen Bitcoin and like, oh yeah, we'll have that. And I, I, most of the most of the buying mm. you see is from just the individual large investors. Yeah, but that's what makes a difference. If you if you catch one of them, then you're sorted. Mm. Okay, so just so we can kind of frame this discussion on economics. I know you've humbly asserted num- a number of times that you're not an economist, <laughs> but I think it's cool. It's like, just before we start this conversation, it's like that meme, like, first of all, I'm not a rapper. <laughs> then uh. just like start spitting fire. <laughs> first of all, I'm not an economist, but okay. what is the purpose of economics? Like, what are we trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. That's a big question. <laughs> do you want me to write your essay? <laughs> Well, I, I give you I give you as much time as you need, but as in I, I think it, it's more like in general. How do you think about this? Because we live in an interesting time as far as you know, rising yeah. wealth inequality. We've almost got this like I think I believe with the level of intervention that's <coughs> happening in markets, especially in finance, um, I I believe it's entrenching corporate elite essentially. Yeah. Um, and businesses are taxed less than people, so right, they end yeah, up accumulating more all these other things, yeah, and they just do share it. buybacks, and it's, yeah, right, and like businesses pay pay tax on their profit, and people pay tax on their revenue. Depends where you live, yeah, yeah. So there's all these problems like that, but they're not necessarily problems. It depends on, but yeah, generally it's getting it's getting less equal with like wealth distribution because people with it are just accumulating so much. It's why like the the older generations have so much wealth compared to the young ones, even like at the same age. Older millennials have no idea as much as boomers did when they were saying it. It's because like the appreciation of assets has just increased so much. But a lot of that is based on um, an increasing population, which isn't necessarily happening all over the world anymore. Like that was mm. <laughs> Keynesianism is kind of like predicated on that. Right, it's like on okay, well, as long as you've got a growing population, then you can just kind of sort of hand it to the next generation. You don't have to worry about it, right? Because you, you'll be dead by the time it. Yeah, comes yeah, around. yeah. But I, I think. We're probably reaching a point where, so with the coronavirus, you're, you're seeing lots of government handouts and so on. It's sort of a universal basic income. And people, like a lot of people are unemployed, but the world's kind of still turning. Um, maybe not so much in America. So, okay. People are realising they don't necessarily have to work as much as they do, or they're realising they can work from home. Yeah, it, it's interesting what will happen, like if it's possible to actually sustain unemployment at that level without the world imploding. Right. It's just a big experiment, really. We, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah. I, I think people will be... People don't like wealth inequality, but they'll be more okay with it if they don't have to work all day for like no reason, mm. really. Because like, as, as we get more automation and so on, it just it becomes unnecessary. So I, I think... I, I guess I have a fairly optimistic... The only thing I, I don't think there's going to be like a huge revolution or people starving or anything. I, I think we'll, we'll sort it out with automation and... Um, yeah, universal basic income of some sort. Say if the goal is social stability and that people's basic needs are provided for, then wealth inequality doesn't matter, really. You know, unless uh, unless yeah, it makes things some degree, right? Like, I, Yeah, well, I don't think people are going to um, have a revolution about not, not being able to go skiing twice a year or something, right? So mm. Obviously, they're going to have a revolution if they can't eat. It depends what part of the economy you're subsidising. And Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if... Maybe people would have a revolution about not being able to ski, because because I've never been skiing. Yeah, either have I. But like, I guess the point is like about you could call it luxury activities. You know, not having access to luxury stuff because people are very easily envious. So my I've got a theory that envy and desire are very powerful things, and I think we're not we're not as aware of our envy as we are of say greed. So we've managed to kind of hijack greed to make that work to some social benefit i think having competitive markets and yeah all yeah these that's things. true it gives people a way to get what they want without having to commit violence right so. exactly and then exactly man so then if you have consumerism which is like just cop it's just copying people pretty much it's so much based on like peer pressure and, and advertising where you like look at someone and go like you're supposed to feel it insecure and and fallen short unless you copy what you see in the ad and as long as the economy is growing and the amount of resources available are growing and people can keep buying stuff and we can mass produce things it's okay everyone can have colgate toothpaste everyone can have the latest clothes you know everyone can can get that envy fix but i reckon if you turn off the the supply and you keep turning up 
the pressure on people to be envious people could just flip out man yeah maybe i i don't know i i'm not sure it's that big of a deal yeah I, i'm gonna have to think about that more i don't well making it a little bit more concrete then we were just talking okay. about how you've got this unprecedented economic intervention from governments with you know people getting their salaries paid by the government is it foreseeable yeah. that they just don't go away somehow no, I, I think that they're going to do their best to try and rein it back in because otherwise they're going to have to keep bailing out companies. There, there's going to be hyperinflation. If you don't stop doing that, there'll be hyperinflation. And then that just solidifies the wealth inequality even more because people with capital, like you're never going to be able to afford it if your money gets worth less and less and less over time. Right. Mm. Well, like, so many people, they live paycheck to paycheck and they're happy doing that. Right. And they're never going to be able to move beyond that. They're never going to be able to buy a house and actually own it. If that's true, why hasn't there been inflation already? Or will there be some inflation from... Well, there, there has been asset inflation, right? Like, well, if you look at the American stock market, some of them are hitting all-time highs when you have all-time high unemployment at the same time, right? That doesn't make any sense. Right. How is that happening without... Because the, the Fed's printing so much money, and most of that is going to businesses rather than normal people. Mm. And I, I think a lot of it as well is like, well, with everything going on in the world, there's still no better investment than American equities, so people still just pile into that because they don't have any other choice. So like the inflation is happening. It's just it's not apparent. So how, how would you be able to pull off basic income without causing hyperinflation? <laughs> you know the answers. Um, You're lying. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, you just have... Well, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to really, would you? Uh, have higher <laughs> inflation, like targeted. Um, but no, it would just. This is what I'm saying, right? It would mm. cause hyperinflation, and you'd never be able to move to like an upper class because or it would be like extremely difficult unless you sold something to a rich person. Got it. It just makes it more and more difficult. Right. So, so you you could potentially find because a way. Because that's worth more. Yeah. So you yeah. could potentially find a way to provide for people's needs without them working, but essentially. The cost of that is we're going to entrench people where they're at, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like you, if you had like hyperinflation, well, you could move. You could just actually. I don't want to say anymore. I don't know. Oh <laughs> come on, man. We're just spitballing. No. <laughs> no, no one's gonna hold you to account. Someone's gonna like come to your house. Like you said, mate, that we figured it out and we tried it. Some guy from like the treasury or something. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there are books out there that explain it much better than I do. Okay, so what do you think about this? I don't think that even if we could do it, it's a good idea. What, because people get too lazy, or...? It's not that, it's just, you know, there's like this idea of being too reliant on a system or something, you know? Yeah, well, I, I guess, like, you need something in your life to like, work towards as well, so that would that would change a lot, but mm. it, it could be something... Well, it, it's difficult, right, because you don't necessarily need it to be something that's um, sitting on the, the hierarchy of needs, right? You don't have to... Yeah. You could just be a trucker all your life and be happy, right? It's not a big deal. Right. I think paradoxically, often people to work for. Yeah. yeah, and people, but people often say that you don't. There's no correlation with happiness and wealth, and I think that's because a lot of the basic human satisfaction <coughs> comes from actually getting yeah. your needs from working yeah. covered. Um, yeah. It's it's not it's not the holidays. It's not the it's not the ski trip. It's actually putting food on the table, putting a roof over your head. If you get a sense that there's a direct connection between driving a truck or working in an office, whatever it is you do, and, and getting the basic needs covered, that's what's satisfying people to People like being people. productive, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the people who are creative enough to envision a world where there's basic income are bright enough to figure out how to keep themselves happy and occupied even when they have yeah. their basic needs met. And they don't realize yeah. that if you just give a guy a check and say, like, this covers all your food and stuff, a lot of everyday people are going to be like, hang on, no, I don't want this. I want to drive my truck, man. But this is this is also why there's an interesting phenomena where a lot of working class people will like elect economically conservative governments because they actually don't like the idea of like you social don't want welfare. To be overworked. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, like, but they'll maybe. be like, I don't yeah. want, I don't want more social I guess welfare. There's some, I want it. There's some sort of attitude towards that, yeah. But or if you just, if you just, if you're a politician <clears throat> and you go into a neighborhood and just yell jobs, 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 like people will just vote for you. Because he's going to make more jobs, man, and that's that's what makes people happy and that's what people want. I feel like with basic income, people have rushed to trying to figure out how to do it before they've answered what exactly we're trying to fix there. Yeah, that's true. 
Mm. One of your unhinged, completely uneducated economic ideas is that we are in an abundance economy. Post-abundance. Post-abundance, uh, sorry, yeah. We'll just explain exactly what you mean by that. It means people have all the things they need. Uh, and, like, they don't need to struggle for anything, really, like, resource-wise. Like, they don't need mm. to work for food or shelter or whatever. Okay, so the question that the post-abundance thing ri- rises is, raises sorry, is yeah. what should people do then? If you don't need to work <clears throat> to put food on the table and a roof over your head, what are you going to do all day? Uh, it gets pretty political when you get into this, I guess. Yeah. Um, is it though? It is an interesting. Well, yeah, because you can start talking about like child policies and that, right? Because mm. if everyone has as many resources as they want, then like, can they have as many kids as they want? Mm. Like, mm. How does that affect things and like yeah what do people do with the time they don't have to work there's so many things right but see i'd say a higher percentage of our generation is playing games and i think we're better we're better at like filling time than older people are like we yeah that's definitely true we definitely have more things to do especially like on our own i guess like people Mm. they're happier just staying in all the time so maybe we're more we're already more adjusted to like Maybe this yeah that that would make sense, but I don't I don't think it's that fulfilling to do that necessarily compared to work. Uh, I don't, it's very it's very complicated. I don't. You wish you were driving a truck sometimes, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Just put put the VR headset on, do <laughs> Euro Truck Simulator. Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah. So I'm originally from Australia. I've lived in Belgium and the Netherlands and Hong Kong. Yeah. So I've experienced a few different ways of doing things. Hong Kong's like fully libertarian very small government is it still well it's it's changing very quickly uh, especially on a social level but historically it's extremely libertarian in in some ways i mean they've got this messed up land system so like there's this entrenched land tycoons but my point is more that say if you talk to i used to argue with this guy from norway when i lived in belgium Mm -hmm. because norway's like the perfect country it's got this perfect system it's impossible to become homeless everyone's wealthy and whatever and i'm like yeah but you've got this massive system society is like very rigid actually but it's supposedly working so it's justified but i think in the in the anglo tradition america really took it to its most extreme there's this idea where we don't really have a strong the like a social structure or system and that's to protect the idea that people should be allowed to try to figure out the world for themselves or something like that's kind of precious to us is that just another way of saying natural selection maybe yeah maybe it's more individualistic the thing that scares me about something like norway or even belgium and the netherlands are a bit like this is everyone oohs and ahs at some perfect social system that that takes care of everyone and i do i'm not denying that that's actually really nice to be around but i I think it does kind of squeeze out the individual a little bit i think that's a real thing it's not just like a you know a a right-wing politician's talking point like i actually do feel that in terms of being like less creative with what you can do with your life yeah yeah because because there's so much pressure to be like a cog in a system i I mean the, the price of individuality is that if you try to put the world together yourself and you mess up in, in your assessment, you could end up poor and homeless. Like, that is the... And isolated, everyone will just go, you're crazy and wrong. And if you're wrong, then that's where you are. You're just a crazy wrong guy. But, <laughs> but, if, but if, if, if you say something crazy and you have the, the latitude to, to explore it and it turns out you're right, you can really, like, propel everyone else forward or something like that. That's yeah, the theory. Um, I, I don't think that happens as much anymore i think you like yeah all right all right well we'll get back on to to that other topic the generational thing you were saying before like you know, boomers had more had more wealth per person than than what yes. our generation has at the same age do you think that's going to get worse or better well yeah it will, it will continue getting worse until they die off probably mm-hmm. and then i don't know i don't know what happened there'll be just some sort of redistribution <laughs> to their kids and to the government mm. and that might help to like slow down inflation somewhat do you think that i don't know it's going to be very different do you think that is there something that's changed in the rules of our economy that's made that happen or is it just that people are living longer so they're hoarding wealth for longer well it, it's set up kind of like a ponzi scheme um because it, it's based on like what well, it is 
<laughs> it's like they all shares what 40, 40 years ago or so and they've been buying them through their working lives and those have gone up like 3,000% or whatever right and the only mm. reason this happens because the economy has grown so much because of the, this credit and this borrowing and uh, they're just leveraging everything into the future right it's like and that only happens because of population growth yeah right that, that has to continue happening so you get more and more and more people in all right so the old people they get all their houses for relatively cheap and they make loads of money and the new people have to pay like 40 years worth of wages to get a house or something like in china it's got to that point right and they're just like unbelievably expensive so and yeah because it, it just gets priced out because they know people like need a house so they they just price that price it in and mm. they make all the money on it because mm. they're around before so why, why wouldn't you but it wasn't always like this right uh no it, i i guess it was more like the reagan era they like deregulated everything do you think it was a like, good move no probably not i i'm not can we just can we just uh, go back in, um, increase capital gains like get rid of a lot of the tax incentives for well, you, you can't you, ta- you can't tax oh well, this is interesting actually yeah because you can't tax the wealth directly but i think if eventually the wealth the wealth divide becomes so extreme but yeah, you even need to increase capital gain tax significantly or you want to, like, actually tax wealth. But then some people try and, like, they'll move to Monaco or whatever yeah. to get out of the way. So you need to find a way around that. Um, I, I do think in the future for cryptocurrency, say, like, anonymous um, coins, you, you'll probably be, you'll see a lot of demand for people who want to hide their money mm. or hide their wealth in some way. It's basically, we're not taxing corporations enough, um, but people are still getting tax loads. So it's but just, it- like... Isn't it, it's just painful for most people. Isn't it true that if you increase corporate tax, they just increase the cost of products? They can only do that to a certain point, though, because eventually no one can afford it anymore. So, yeah, that is, it's not always true. It depends. There, it's, there's so many things. Like, it depends how many competitors they have. depends on what regulations there are. Yeah, it's, it's just a game of cat and mouse, really, just chasing prices around. Oh, man. It's a bit of a mess. Yeah. It's a bit of a mess, but luckily you've got all the answers, even though you're not <laughs> going to tell us all of them in the interview. I don't know who you think I am, John. <laughs> <laughs> but I just make squiggly lines. <laughs> but the squiggly line was true, so that must mean that you, you understand the economy. You've That's planned correct. everything. Yeah. Okay, so you don't understand economics that much. <laughs> but, I don't but, know how to work these things. But you are relatively good at predicting things in general, would you say? Yeah, I, if predicting is the word, but yeah, I guess so. I'm, I'm good at seeing what's going to happen in the market, or before other people do, generally. Mm. Like, I, I'm good at seeing opportunities, I think. So do you have yeah. any general ideas about the future that you think are not widely held beliefs, but you think that are true? I think one thing, so we're getting better at... Um, making like CGI and synthesizing voices and so on. So I think probably by the end of this decade, you won't be able to trust anything you see on the internet because you'll be able to make anything like synthetically. You'll be able to, yeah, anything you want. So like viral videos and everything, they probably most of them won't be real. Just like it's, it's already hard enough to trust the information you see on the internet, but in the future it's going to become impossible. Um, and I think that will probably drive people away from social media somewhat because it becomes impossible to see to like trust all the things you see on there and it becomes say you're like a state or something and you have a narrative to spin yeah it, it becomes very easy to like put through propaganda and and so on like this yeah it's easy to manipulate people if you can start faking stuff quite easily um the technology is nearly there i think by the end of this decade it will be it will be very easy to do that see that that's really interesting man I don't think people talk about it that much either. There were a few posts recently about like uh, simulated environments and stuff, but I mean like um, like actually simulating people, yeah, um, convincingly and backgrounds and all that. And um, there's like synthetic pop stars. I can't remember what label yeah, it is, yeah, but yeah. They, they've made their own pop star. That doesn't actually exist, and they've given her a backstory and everything. And she um, got I saw this got, one. She got like a record deal or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like that's. That's been in the making for ages. If you know who Hatsune Miku is, right? That's a, that's just a sound font, right? Mm-hmm. That they've put a character with. There's a lot of these. They, they sound very similar to real people. Like you can modify them a lot, but like by the end of the decade, it will be impossible to tell the difference between one of them and a real person. And then like if you have AI on top of that that can actually simulate a conversation, then you'll be able to make fake people on the internet like so easily. Yeah. So people will probably socialize mostly with people they know then. 
as in personally no not as in i know the celebrity yeah uh, like i know i'm yeah. talking to you because it's like i hit you up on telegram and messaged you and then we got on a call <laughs> so i know i'm talking to name and address withheld yeah oh sorry i'll cut that out <laughs> 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 uh the real cryptopathic um <laughs> or maybe i'm talking to a fake one that's an AI hijacked this like interview and then taught itself how to sound exactly like you and then started going around just talking to people. Yeah, I, I think that's probably like the closest thing that will blindside people, I think. I think there'll be a lot of things that happen in the next decade that don't actually happen. Shit, man. that That is a super interesting idea and I think it's a slam dunk because I've had a similar thought um, about how, you know how everyone freaked out in the last US election about Russian interference? Yeah, I'd be more offended just at humanity in general if other countries weren't trying to interfere in, in your election. It's so easy to manipulate Twitter and social media discussion. Yeah, the, the, especially you? in like the, the West more than the East, right? Because China has their, their internet kind of locked down behind a firewall and so on. It's difficult yeah. to access and it's difficult to go out of it as well, right? But yeah. then the West is like completely open. So if you're yeah. in a foreign state and you want to interfere or like on social media, it's so easy. Right. There's all this ruckus about it, but people fundamentally haven't, don't really understand like what the actual implication is there. As in, say, you've got all these politicians on TV and they're like, Trump needs to tell Putin to stop it. Actually, the whole thing's just changed forever. We're never yeah. going to go back. You can't actually guarantee now. There, there's so much garbage information out there. And if you link, like, it, it's already making people do things. Like, people tear down 5G towers. Right. Because of the stuff they see on Facebook. But, like, that's just the beginning of it. Like, that's not even good. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even convinced. Yeah, yeah. You can actually, like, disprove it scientifically. But, like, you, it's going to go so far beyond that. Yeah, so it's just, a, that's just the new paradigm. Like, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't fight that. You have to accept it and then figure out what to do. But asking your president to fly on a plane to russia to tell someone to stop is not the solution like that's not going to do anything say it was russia next okay. time it might just be some random people just for fun making massive bots well i, th I think that's what it was last time anyway <laughs> right yeah that that's why i said you know say it's russia because i actually think it's a mixture of it's a whole mixture of things but people like to attribute it to someone that that's why i also think it's so ridiculous to be like Oh, you know, someone go and talk to Putin. It's like, oh yeah, is he gonna stop some random dude sitting on his computer all day just like writing misinformation manually? It, yeah. There's people in America doing that. So you're right. Like the technology to make that possible is only gonna get more and more prevalent. But that actually gives me a lot of hope. We already have so much misinformation anyway. It's just that people don't realize it, or they don't yeah. really understand it, especially older people. <laughs> yes. So there's already fake info, but if the fake information becomes completely fake and real fake, as in, you know, I can make a video of a, a politician saying anything I like and it's completely yeah. indistinguishable from a fake video, at least then for boomers and stuff, they can look at that and hopefully go like, oh, well, wow, look, there's a lot of fake information out there, you know, rather than being like, I just spent an hour on Facebook and I believe everything I saw there. But so, yeah, it's going to be a big like generational divide. I, th I think kids, mm. younger people, will probably figure out they can't trust all that stuff. But it, it will probably mean people move away from platforms, or they have stricter rules on what can and can't be posted. I wonder if boomers will do something weird. Like, say you're like a grandparent, and you you mm. want to talk to your grandkids, but your grandkids are like, "No, nah, I'm too busy." <laughs> so you you can like train <laughs> an AI. Make a fake. <laughs> you know, like you can just call your grandkids and talk to them about like whatever and it'll just like That's it'll kind of scary churn their like social media so it can talk to your grandmother about what you've been up to and stuff oh uh, well there's you can do stuff like that with like you can meet like a dead relative in vr or something it's just so freaky yeah like, i heard about this we're going into a very strange world mm. i actually think old people might do something weird like that but i think young people it could actually be good for us force us to Back into the real world. You know? Back into the real world. Get it. Because we have our devices on us all the time anyway, right? Like if they evolve to have like AR and like glasses and stuff, then you can just have this stuff mm. constantly being like bombarding to you. So we'll see how far it, it gets, I guess. Like yeah. how bad it gets. Yeah. Um, but then that'll, that'll probably open up like a whole 
whole new market of things to trade mm. and do and right. so on. So okay. more opportunities. I got a couple of ideas on this. So one of them is about economics. Uh, with mm-hmm. VR, it's a nice way to continue consumerism without jeopardizing the entire environment. Because okay. if you can just consume digital goods, then you know you can you can consume as much as you like and you can produce as much as you like. But there's there's no impact on the environment. Yeah, well, it, it depends how realistic it is, right? So I've got a Valve Index. Mm. It's a great VR headset. The sound on it is absolutely flawless. It's amazing. Um, you like you can't distinguish it from the real is thing. It, wait, it's, it's is this, are these headphones or is this one of those like? It's a, it's a headset and their headphones on it. Okay. The headphones on oh, the headset okay. are just like they're they're perfect, but mm. um, everything else is nowhere near that standard. Um, like the vision, if you see advertisements for it, it's never as good as the advertisement normally because like right. yeah, not only do you need like a really good computer to run it, but then the resolution isn't as high, the refresh rate isn't amazing. So but it, it's good, but it's not it's not like convincing, mm. like real life convincing, and it will be a very long time before we get to that. And then on top of that, you have things like touch how do you have how do you simulate that that's probably not going to happen for a very long time yeah like, I, I don't see how um well except with like very specific things but yeah yeah maybe eventually we'll probably i got a feeling on a long enough timeline essentially you skip the vr shit uh, you actually have you don't have like a physical device on your hands or head it, it just would just route it straight into your brain somehow like Neuralink <laughs> style okay but i think it yeah that could be another way yeah yeah, I, but I have I have high hopes that in the long run this could be really good for the environment because we could essentially human beings have this need to build stuff and we're very creative like we like to create yeah. things to look at and play with and and the problem well, is yeah, we've got all the kids playing Minecraft right they made so much stuff in there yeah so yeah 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 so. that's a good point yeah, like, yeah. imagine if they'd all yeah, use Lego good. instead how much extra plastic there'd be in the world <laughs> you know maybe it's true they're saving the environment. I mean, it's just yep. trying to put a positive spin on it, I guess. Yeah, 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 you're right. One iteration of this could actually be if you had a game. Oh, talk about that, yes. Yeah, if you had a game where you have like virtual goods inside, if you had them all on a blockchain, then. It... That's okay. That's uh, this is a big thing to talk about. So that's actually been attempted. There's something called Wax. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the one. Um, and there's lots of there's lots of other things that are attempting this as well with ERC seven twenty tokens. But so CSGO skins huge industry one of the biggest gambling sites got shut down by Valve well, it wasn't it was an exchange but they also did gambling which is really stupid so they got shut down and mm-hmm. then everyone's skins on the site got banned with the site's bots because it was it was all stored on their bots um, and so they said okay you haven't actually lost your skin so we're going to make a blockchain called wax token or wax chain or whatever and we're going to put them on there on the blockchain but you can't actually move them around within the steam system so they're worthless Right, but they're like, oh, well, you can move them. You, they're decentralized now. They're on a blockchain. <laughs> but they don't actually do anything. So they, they had this whole thing. They tried to set up. They tried to do that. But like, it, it, it needs to work with the game. So it needs to actually work within like a system. So you can have things like CryptoKitties or whatever else. But like, they're not really worth anything mm. if you can't display them. There's a new like VR open world thing that's on the blockchain that people play, but like they never they don't take off because it's only for people who are like into collecting and just, yeah. just tech stuff. Like it's not a proper game. Whereas like with CS:GO, the reason the skins are absolutely huge now mm. is because you can like flex them in game, and there's like whole communities around it. It's about incentives as well. So like if you want to decentralize this stuff, like yeah, it's a good idea. But then the developers are always like the people who make the game. They're always going to be centralized. Like, how many games out there are like decentralized games, right? It's not mm. Mm. a thing. Like, the developers they'll want the money for themselves. So why they create a secondary market? Generally, that's money that they're losing. And then they also have inside information on what items. Like, say they patch the game, right? And they say, okay, those items are useless, and the price goes to zero. Well, if enough people own that item, what if they just fork away and they play on the old version of the game? You, you need to you need to be assured that your items aren't just going to be deleted or become worthless mm, or anything. Mm. Right, that's a big thing. So yeah. with CSGO skins at the moment. So they're huge collectibles and they kind of tick all the boxes for me when I'm like looking for weird investments because like yeah, the collectibles, which are doing great at the moment, just in general, um, there's huge Chinese demand, which is a big growing economy. So you have all the money coming in from them. And then, yeah, you have this market that's open to kids as well. So you have all these rich kids buying these things. They're luxury goods. So you're marketing to rich people who will pay anything for these things so you can get stupid prices on some stuff 
there's a lot of depth to the things that like they're all non fungible. So mm. yeah, you have this like very interesting market. So people actually get interested in it and there's a community around it and then you have speculation with it and um, there are some things so like stickers which I absolutely love because the supply decreases over time. Which where do you get the, how many other assets? Does does the supply like actively decrease? <laughs> Deflationary asset, man. It's a great investment. Not that I have a huge amount of money in it, but well, okay, I guess I <laughs> I have a decent amount in it. But like, the, <laughs> if like Steam just like pulled the plug suddenly, that's the number one risk. But like, you have to think, okay, what are the incentives for them to do that? That might they still make most of the money, like a large large amount of money off of it because people like they gamble by opening cases and they trade it on the market and they buy through yeah man and then also like because it's because you can like trade them freely that actually creates a lot of free advertisement for them which is what they absolutely love like how many i'm sure you've seen like case unboxing videos on youtube right yeah or something yeah. right like that's that's a huge huge thing for them that's you like know, i think the main uh, reason they've kept it in so recently during the lockdown I yeah. started playing CSGO again. Okay. Uh, as you know, because we, we played a little bit together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. One day, I was getting all these cases from playing, and I never thought to open a case. And I was just bored mm. one day and decided, okay, how I'll, I'll open a case. And then next minute, I'd open too many cases and spent <laughs> quite a lot of money. And I was like, oh, what dear. the hell just happened? That was so stupid. Yeah, this is a big thing, like the gambling aspect of it. A lot of countries are cracking down on it. They don't like it. Yeah. Uh, they're banning it. But then Steam, they found this loophole where basically they sell you an item mm. that tells you what's in the case. But because you have to buy that item first to see what's in the case, you're effectively paying for the case before you open it. It's, it's, it's a stupid loophole. Wait, so if you see the... Can you... Uh, how do I explain this? Quickly? But this isn't uh, in all countries, right? This is just in the no, EU this or is... something. Yeah, I, uh, is it Germany? No, I, I think France. I think it was France. Yeah, but they're, they're thinking of doing it in the UK as well. So basically, like, normally you'd have a key, pay for the key to open the case. Yeah. The way it works now is uh, it's not, you're not allowed to open something without knowing what you're getting. Mm. So they said, okay, now you can't open cases unless you buy this x-ray scanner, which tells you what's in, in the case. <laughs> so you buy this one this one-off <laughs> item, the x-ray scanner, right, before you can open the case. And you still have to buy a key as well, but you know what's in the case before you open it, but you right. can't, you, that, it only tell you for the first case. So if you want to open another case and get something different, you have to open that case. So you have to spend the money. Right. And that gets around the law, which is the dumbest it's thing ever. Such scammers, man. Yeah. Scammers. I don't know if you have, um, in Australia, we call them the pokies, uh, like casino the machines. Like you, uh, you just put money in, push a button, does like the yeah. whole like classic. The, the yeah, yeah, yeah. symbols are rolling, and if you get the same symbols, you get money. So, it's a huge problem in Australia. We have okay. these pokies machines because most pubs will have them in a corner. You hear these like things in the background going. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> Bright lights everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. And man, it's it's really crazy. I've done it a couple of times when I've been at the pub with friends, and it's kind of fun complete waste of money but it's easy to think you're better than this kind of thing until say if you, yeah if you drink a little bit so you just become a bit dumber and then you realize how like it's just psychology man it's just human psychology mm -hmm. if, if you're biologically human you're probably susceptible to these machines what shocked me about the csgo unboxing thing was it was exactly the same except it was way more expensive po pokey machines are supposed to be like the most rotten curse and I'm like, damn, these unboxing things are, like, more expensive. Um, yeah, well, the, the reason they get so much demand is because you can sell the things that you get out of them and, like, potentially make money, right? Whereas, like, yeah. you can't go on Fortnite and gamble money. You can't go on whatever mm. other game and do that. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's a huge thing. Well, this has been a super, super good interview, even Thank though you. you've kept your economic cards to your chest. <laughs> what cards? <laughs> <laughs> I'm convinced I'm convinced we're talking to a future future chancellor of the of the UK. <laughs> uh, but just to finish up, an easy one. Area of your expertise, undisputed. Okay. <laughs> I was just trying to think of like a super complicated like economic. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't we haven't talked about crypto that much, I guess. Um, yeah, so I was gonna I was gonna ask like what are your thoughts for cryptocurrency the for the rest um, of the year? Uh, I think we could see like seventy two hundred for Bitcoin. I think that's fine. 
I wouldn't panic. I think, like worldwide events, most bullish. It's ever been fundamentally for Bitcoin. Um, mm. I think if it doesn't perform now, you should be worried. That's another reason I why I was thinking of selling. By the way, okay, we've come, yeah, we've fair come, enough. we've come to the point where it's like hero or zero. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's worth being in Ethereum as well. Like, I think it's worth paying attention to proof of stake because if Bitcoin is just flops, then maybe that's a better idea. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not crazy about DeFi. Really, I okay, it's too complicated for most people. I haven't tried it. I think you should. I think, token. I think you should try Uniswap, man. Okay. It's it's like Shapeshift. It's exactly the same as Shapeshift. They DeFi these DeFi projects. They brought back Shapeshift, man, and okay. it works. That's cool. Yeah. Nice. Okay, to really finish up there on that pricing point, um, it's interesting that. We're both thinking the same thing. It's supposed to shine right now. The conditions. Yeah, I think it in. has recently, like because of the the huge like V shaped recovery. The reason it didn't dip is because there was so much demand. But like I don't. Do we need I'm kind a, of chilling at the moment? I have no idea what's going to happen like immediately. But yeah, I'm still bullish. Are we really correlated with stocks, or is it just a coincidence? There was there was a a week where it was like perfectly correlated. It was so weird. Mm. But uh, when we were in like seven thousand range or whatever. I've never seen anything like it. It was like we'd move identically to the S and P. Okay. That that was that was driving me insane. I think it's so I've never seen anything like that. But yeah, there there is definitely a correlation there. Um, I'm assuming that's because of there's like some funds involved that buy and sell based on the index. Mm. Um, when was this though? This was after the crash. Yeah. So i um, maybe maybe people did it afterwards. So they're like, oh look, we. I, I think it's possible stocks, like one so. of the. Like obviously, like some really big players were wiped out in the crash. So like whoever was left, if they use that correlation as part of their model, or, like they they obviously had more influence over the price, mm. and then maybe it became like a self fulfilling thing. It was it was a really odd thing. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. I I didn't know it was that strong at any given point because yeah everyone's like oh you know Bitcoin's a risk asset and it will just trade with stocks and like oh yeah you can compare it to a collectible as well because like a lot of people who buy it they just never let go of it so yeah that's true i've always been accumulating i sold some bitcoin at the end of 2017 i wanted just to have that savings where it's like mm -hmm. i don't care what happens now but apart from that i've always been holding waiting for the next financial crisis like that was the whole point like it was born out of the last one mm -hmm. and we we're waiting for the next one and now it but this isn't a normal financial crisis well we're not we haven't really had a financial crisis we've had a yeah, this is the big test. Like we're trying to get to see what what happens. Mm. Um, Could be the calm fun. before the storm. <laughs> I don't think it's very calm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, define calm. Well, everyone's at home, man. CBD. <laughs> <laughs> the officers, are, the officers are calm, man. I mean, if yeah. if you just didn't leave the city, I think you'd be like, oh, what's going on here? Interesting times, though. Fun times. Didn't I, oh, I read something in Australia like there, there was like buses of people showed up to some rural village and they just took all their food they just bought everything and they didn't have any food left ah yeah we, Melbourne's having a, a little a mini outbreak at the moment okay so some of the suburbs are in lockdown we've had issues with hoarding but yeah I, I don't know I, I, I still think it is relatively calm okay I that's cool I, I th yeah I think that'll be a second wave I'd be surprised if there isn't really because it means a lot of the stuff we know about the virus isn't correct we don't really understand the transmission and like fatality rate like properly. Like still, there's still like huge discrepancies depending on what, what data you look at and like mm. how data it is. It's weird how it's taken so long. Yeah. Um, well, 5G is a new technology, so it doesn't <laughs> surprise me that we don't understand. Oh. <laughs> we gotta go take them down. It's funny when you said about 5G. I just pictured there was this video going around on Twitter of like a walking tower thing. I don't know if you saw. Oh that. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're all tweeting like, "Wow, the five G towers are actually pretty weird, eh?" <laughs> uh, anyway, man, this has been really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Thanks. That's awesome, man. Hopefully, you can come on again later um, when you yeah. when you've uh, clarified your your economic I've written theory. a book about this yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> come back to show your book. I get, I get it, man. You're just saving <laughs> the ideas for the book. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, good stuff man.